I was so happy when Darlene asked me about her and Kathy together, wanted to, me to see what I remembered and what I can think about, about the history of Baker when I came to Baker. Well, I said in my last statement, I was talking about the family, that it was 1948 when I went into the service. I had just dropped out of Louisiana College and I volunteered to go into the Air Force. And I stayed in there four years. I went overseas twice. I was in the bird and the airlift, and then I was a crew chief on an F-86 Sabre jet. I was given, uh, I went in for three years, and when the Korean War started, President Truman gave all of those people that were in the service, we got another year. So if I'd been in there four years, when I got out, was my last trip was uh, from Ipswich, England, and we landed in New York. And that's where I was discharged, Camp Kilmer in New Jersey, where I was discharged there. Came home, was not married yet, so wherever mom and daddy was, that was home. So came back, daddy had uh, been pastor in the church up at Rayville, which we talked about and we gave behind the history. Well, he had just been called to the first church in Baker. Mama was so sick and uh, homesick when she was living in Rayville, and she instigated everything. So she had a big part in daddy accepting that pastorate in Baker because it was home to us, Baton Rouge was. So I never will forget it. I'd only been out of the service about two weeks. And Daddy asked me if I'd drive him up to Baker. Well, I didn't even know where Baker was, but he says a little place north of Baton Rouge. And the First Baptist Church has issued me a call, and I've got to go meet with the pulpit committee and tell them some things that I wanted. Just like a contract when the coaches get a contract with a football team. It was some things that were negotiable. So Daddy went and met with the pulpit committee, but I drove him up there, then we'll forget this. I drove him to Baker, and we, but the Groom Road was gravel, Highway 19 was gravel, or it just, had just been resurfaced or surfaced. Uh, so we came there, parked across the street from the high school, because that's where the church was located. But I, Daddy asked me if I wanted to go in with him, I said, no, I'll, I'll just wait in the car. Well, it was a little, you've seen a many of them, a little rural country church, a little wood frame building. And I was sitting down under those trees across the street, and Daddy went inside. And I looked around, I, and I knew I was coming back to probably stay with Mom and Daddy. And uh, I, I looked over there at that little church and looked at them gravel roads around there. I said, man, look, I done been to New York City. I said, I'm not coming to this little dumpy place. Well, anyway, Daddy told him what he wanted, and that was he had made arrangements to go visit his relatives in Germany. I told you about this, and uh, so he told them, but they were, they were so excited about that because a lot of the people in that church, like K.T. Burr and some of those people, were charter members of Southside Church. And they knew Daddy, and they, and they wanted him. They had all moved to Baker. So they gave Daddy the call. He said, but one thing, if you'll give me 30 or 45 days to make my trip to Germany, I'll accept it when I come back. Oh, they, will. they said, that's fine, that's fine. So that's when Daddy went on. Well, it's funny how things work in our lives. That, uh, uh, the most unusual things, we talked about some of them. And I think about Baker, and uh, about that time, it was 1953. Uh, got out of service in, in 52, but I met Georgia, which I talked about before. And we got married in Baton Rouge. Didn't have a place to stay, so we lived with mom and daddy. I passed that old parsonage regular cutting through to go over to the city hall and I, I passed there and I see that little old bedroom there on the front of the house, a little old frame house where George and I stayed for about 30, 45 days before we got a place up in Zachary. And the reason for that was, uh, I think I might have mentioned this, that when I was 
on my way back on the troop ship. Uh, it, and a troop ship is just like a city. And they had a regular little old newspaper, and this guy picked out different people to interview, and he interviewed me. I don't know why he picked me, because I guess I stood out in the crowd being so small. But anyway, he asked me what my plans were. He knew I was coming home to be discharged. I said, I want to come back to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I want to get a job with Standard Oil, which is Exxon today. And I said, I want to make $1,000 a month. That was my goal in life, was to go to, because a bunch of my aunts, uh, uncles and cousins and everybody worked. And that was the best jobs in Baton Rouge at that particular time. But it didn't happen. It didn't happen for me. Uh, but I did go to work for Gulf State Utilities, who really was a better, better situation uh, to be in. And they could go, made so many good friends. I only worked for them for about 10 months, uh, but half of Gulf States came to mind at George's wedding, which was at the Old Emanuel Baptist Church. And so we got married, we moved in with mom and daddy, and then Georgia worked for right person insurance agency in Baton Rouge. And she was experienced in the insurance business, so there was a, an insurance agency in Zachary, R.O. McCrane, Mr. McCrane had been the principal, I think, of Baton Rouge High School, very successful, had a lot of money, but he had McCrane Insurance Agency in Zachary. So Georgia went and met with them and they hired her. Well, I was working for Gulf State Utilities and my office was in Zachary too, so we moved to Zachary. The little old apartments we stayed in are gone now. They belong to Mr. Al Kirkwood. He had two of them right on the main street. If you know where the Mary Lee Donuts is, it's right across the street. But Mr. Kirkwood long ago tore those down. So we lived there for a while in, uh, in Zachary. I tell all of these mayors that been there, they said, the best thing that ever happened to you was when I moved out of Zachary. Because I said, I've been the mayor of Zachary. Be joshing, you know, and being funny. But anyway, uh, <laughs> I can remember this, my take-home pay, take-home pay for every two weeks was $93. And Georgia was probably making a little less than that, but you know, we lived, we had, we had a nice car, and, and it, it, I guess everything is relative, you know, but you, uh, we had everything we needed. We didn't have everything we wanted, but we had everything we needed. And we lived there until, uh, I bought this service station in Bacon. It was right across the side street there from, uh, from the Baker Parsonage. And this station belonged to a, a Mr. Dude Welch. I know everybody's heard probably of uh, Duke Welch, the big judge. Well, that was his uncle. Duke's daddy drove a Coca-Cola truck and called on me there at the service station. But anyway, and I've been trying to think, how did I get the money to buy that thing? I know Daddy had to given it to me. And uh, one of them loans that Daddy's made that they never get paid back. <laughs> so with my kids have done me, I did that to Daddy. Daddy lent me the money. I bought that service station. And it, it was, well, it had another little old station there, but it was the station. Everybody in Baker traded with me. Everybody owed me. And so when they were doing Highway 19, uh, I had customers that would jump because you couldn't go through it. It was blocked off. It was one that I survived because there was no traffic on it. But the people that owed me, they would jump ditches and everything else to get over there to be able to charge that gas. Now when they had cash, they'd go to the fellow down the street because I could sit and watch them. And I'd uh, say, that time going to owe me money. But he's down there giving his cash to that, but he's going to ride me. But anyway, some of the big high rollers were not sold out to Mr. Wallace Johnson, who had been working for me. Uh, it was who's who of Baker was on my list of bad debts that I had to eat when I left there. But anyway, that's part of Baker. When we got to Baker, there were some people there, not a whole lot. Because Baker, look, when I ran the first time for councilman in 1956, I got nearly every vote cast, and it was only 150 votes. Everybody voted at one precinct, and they 
councilman or at large, you had eight or ten people running, and whoever got the top seat, all that changed when reapportionment came on the scene, where you would have to run from district. But it was a better government, in my opinion. I know what they were trying to do. They were trying to, and it was a fair thing, I guess, trying to help some blacks be in a position to get elected, because it's almost impossible back in those days, when you voted at large, because there was so many more white people than it was black. But I think it, it's a two-edged sword. It's got some good points and it's got some bad ones. And one of the, one of the things was that uh, you had to answer to the whole city. See, the way it is now, we each have a little separate district. Well, a guy in another that doesn't live in my district, I don't do this because I'm still a, a Baker man. I'm not a district person. I help people in other districts, but normally the way it works, one that councilman that go over that district, that's the one he looks out for, rather than looking out for the city as a whole. But anyway, we, we ran in 1956. I had been in Baker for, since 1952. And so when, when, when I ran and got elected, it was, it was a, it's funny how little towns are. You know, I don't even know if, if I'm accepted now, but they had what they call an old-timers club. That was the people that was in Baker when we got there, like O.C. Brown's mom and daddy, uh, the Days, Miss Dr. Day, Susie Gotro's grandmother, uh, the Phelpses, uh, Mr. Prescott was there, some people by the name of Fairchild. Uh, they were the old folks that uh, Billy Day, his daddy was Spencer Day, and uh, but that was the old timers club, and they never did let me in it. I, I never tried to, but I, I just didn't get accepted by them. And so Baker was a very small community. Everybody knew everybody else's business, and so that's that's what we were in. But I had that little old service station, and then too with daddy being a preacher, uh, it got me known among the folks. And uh, I, knelt, I was telling somebody just yesterday, I can remember standing out, I had one boat in precinct in Bacon. It was, it was a building on the school ground there. They called it the wreck building. It, you've seen them, most little uh, school districts had them in these rural areas. It's a big old building, windows in the side, they had basketball goals in it, and everything took place in that little old building. And that's where you voted, where you had to go through a little old gate off of Groom Road, right straight across from the First Baptist Church. And I, I never will forget this. Daddy was the preacher. I had the service station. I stood out there shaking every hand that came through. And like I said, it was about 150 voters. And they'd all come through that gate. Well, Daddy would be there with me. He got me elected, I believe. But anyway, he would tell people, he'd say, look, if you can't vote for Pete, pray for him. <laughs> and so, so some of my good buddies, man, I went there and I, I fully intended to vote against you. But when your daddy told him you can't vote for him, pray for him, he said, man, I changed my mind. So I'm gonna give daddy credit for getting me elected that first time. And that was in 1956. I think we, Baker was a village and you know you have different classes. When you read a certain population, you go from a village to a town, to a city, to a big city. And that's, and you had to go through a process. When, when I, I remembered I was in with this little group and one of the people that was spearheaded was a, a Reverend Corley. He was a Methodist preacher at the Baker Methodist Church and some other folks. And back in those days, they had what they called a a Democratic Executive Committee. You had a local one and you had a state one. And the head of that committee lived in Shreveport and he had to sign off on the fact that Baker had reached this population which qualified them to be a, a town. And some of us, two or three of us went to Shreveport, drove up there, took the papers up there for him to sign and Baker became a town. And from then on things started progressing. I was a councilman back in those days, an alderman as they call them, for eight years. I was a mayor pro tem because Mayor Henry Smith worked at Exxon and he was uh, a big deal out there. I mean, 
Back in those days, it looked like it, uh, not Exxon, I said it, uh, Ethel Corporation. He worked, he was, he was right at the top if he wasn't the top man. And Ethel used to strike all the time. I, you, you know, you probably didn't pay that much attention to it. But whenever they would go on strike, the union people wouldn't, wouldn't come out, so the, the company people, as they called them, uh, they would have to run the plant. And so they would lock those guys up for 30, 40, 60 days even, where they stayed out there to run the plant. So Henry got locked up a lot of times, and I was the mayor pro tem, and when the mayor wasn't there, I had to take his place. So uh, we went on, and then Henry decided, he was a heck of a guy. His wife, um, can't think of a name right now, but I might before it's over, but she, she taught piano. And she taught Kathy, lovely lady, I mean, just a sweet, sweet, nice lady. Lived on a little old side street there, the owner street in Baker at the time was Mac uh, Epperson Street that run down by, beside that, from Groom Road over. And I, I think back, and uh, the, the McBays built about eight or ten little old frame houses, and that was the first real development in Baker. And then I was laying there thinking the other night, I watched them grow from, from that little deal to Baker Heights, to Buff Wood, to Chalure, and I watched every one of these little develop, little uh, subdivision develop into what is, is Baker today. But uh, Henry decided he was not going to run. Well, I was the most logical person, I guess, in my mind anyway, to run because I had been mayor pro temp best political lesson of my life. So I decided I was gonna run for mayor, 1964. I had been a councilman for eight years, had been mayor pro tem, and so I decided, I filled out my paper, ain't, no books, ain't, a, ain't a person on this earth that can beat me, I guarantee that, not when you read everything. Well, it was an old man that lived in Baker. His name was uh, Aubrey Dumas. Just like Woody, but they were no kin. The old man worked for the railroad. He was the head man for the IC Railroad, which passed through Baker. But he lived in a rent house there in Baker. And he was he dressed all the time, dressed up with a suit and everything nice. He's the kind of guy, I'm gonna call him a phony now. <laughs> but he was the kind of guy that people just liked him. He was like a teddy bear to a lot of people, you know. <laughs> and uh, so there he ran. And then it was Billy Day. Billy Day had been a star football player there at Baker. That's when Baker was whipping everything in sight. Baton, all them, whipped all of the Baton Rouge team, Baton Rouge High, Caligar, all of them. Baker was right up in there with them. Billy was an all-sport guy. He played at everything. He was good at it all. Well, his daddy had been the mayor, Spencer Day. He was the second mayor of Baker that Baker ever had. The first mayor was Wedge Kyes who was the principal at Baker High School, that football stadium in, in Baker is named after Wedge Kai, who was the first mayor, and then Billy's daddy. And so Billy decided to run that, put three of us in the race. Man, I was, uh, Bob Nick, I had got out of the Sur Solar Service Station, and Bob Nicholson and I, who were just a heck of a, so smart, and, and we went into insurance, it was Heine Nicholson Insurance. And we owned a little insurance office because they had only one agency there, and that was Miss Jessie Epperson. And she was one of those old folks that was in Baker when I came there. She was a pillar of the First Baptist Church. She had been an alderman. She had a little insurance, she had a lot of money. But she was an old maid. She just, uh, well, she really wasn't an old maid, but you'd have thought she was. And uh, she had a little old insurance business, but she didn't, wasn't uh, going out trying to hustle, but just the people that knew her just went and said, I want your insurance for a car insurance my house. Well, Bob and I went into the insurance business, and uh, we were doing pretty good, but it wasn't enough to support two families, especially when you had two guys that spent half of their time uh, playing golf riding around and both of us had a Volkswagen. They looked just alike. And we would go out there and drink coffee with mama, be in town, ought to be selling insurance out there playing golf. 
Well, we met together one day and said, look, we, we stalled it to death. So one of us is going to have to buy the other one out. And so we talked about it and I said, well, Bob, you have a trade. He was a, a what you call them, that these industrial plants has a guy that uh, kind of, I guess, like a personnel man or whatever, but he, he could get a job easy. And I said, Bob, I have no qualifications to, to, to go out and get another job. So uh, we agreed that I would buy him out. Again, I don't know where I got the money from. <laughs> Daddy probably lent it to me. But anyway, I bought Bob out and it became Heine Agency. And uh, we, were, we, we were making a living and I was on the council. And so uh, we, we went on it like that. And then, but what I was getting ready to tell y'all, I thought I could walk on water. I thought I was the greatest thing since life's brilliant. And I got in that, I printed some little old cards in my service uniform. I still had, I had my Air Force uniform on, that was my handout, because I'd be better. You know, everybody's gonna vote with pro Tim, daddy preacher. Man, I run on daddy's, daddy's resume most of the time. That's the preacher's gift, you know. I'm the preacher's son when I knock on them doors. Well, anyway, now you talk about a political lesson. You're not gonna believe what I'm getting ready to tell you. The three of us ran. I didn't campaign. I just knew I, there wasn't no way they was gonna beat me. Listen to me. Mr. D Mr. Dumas got 485 votes. I got 480 and Billy Day got 475. That is how close that race was. You talk about a little man that got my attention. <coughs> I got out there, boy, I quit playing golf. I said, doing nothing but knocking on doors. And my lucky thing was, Billy Day didn't like either one of us, but he disliked Mr. Dumas more than he disliked me. So he endorsed me. And I won by about 100, 125 votes against the old man in the runoff. But every time I ran after that, Mr. Dumas would run. He would, you could count on him being qualified to qualify for that seat. So anyway, I got elected in 1964 with a real lesson. And I tell you what, and I think most people will tell you, and some people don't think so, but most people think I did a good job because I had something to prove. I knew when I went in there that 50% of the people, uh, close to 50%, didn't want me. So I had to prove to them that I could do the job and that I would be successful at it. And I really did. I, uh, I started getting involved in things like the Louisiana Municipal Association, which put me in the mainstream of knowing what was going on. And I, I brought all those ideas and things to Baker, and God was playing a big part in this because he wanted me to be successful. And, and good things start happening. You know, I think back of my time up in St. Francisville because I never had that, that was not on my mind, but see, God had a, he wanted me there. And where he wants you, he'll put you. Whether you want to go or not, he will put you there. And I'll always go to my grave believing that he sent me to St. Francisville to save that money that the parish was coming into, I'm talking about $17 million from one taxpayer. See, the state had a game plan that they was gonna take that money from those people up there that didn't, really wasn't in the mainstream, didn't know what was going on. Uh, John Hankel was the head of the uh, Senate in the state, and the state was broke. The nuclear plant, which had been tax exempt for 10 years, was coming on to tax rolls, and that was at $17 million. So the, the plan was that the state was gonna give up West Feliciana $2 million, and they were gonna keep the 15 million. That was a game plan, but see, God sent me up there, because I knew just enough about the system and how it worked to be able to go down there and take on this, uh, the legislature. I had been in the Constitutional Convention and knew how things worked at the Capitol. Now I'm not putting, I'm not trying to brag about this, I'm just letting you know 
that in my mind, and I believe when I meet God, he goes, hey, Pete, you did just exactly what I sent you up there to do, to keep the state from taking those people's money. Because that's the way it worked. That they, they figured those people up there laid back and they were just going to take their money and pat them on the head and go on down the road. Well, I did one small thing. I got in touch with the officials down in, in St. Charles Parish because they had a nuclear plant there. And I knew they had stroke in the legislature. See, we had no stroke at all. Smallest parish in the state. Didn't have no, nobody down there looking out for it. So but when I joined in with them and we got together, then we were big enough to fight with them and we fought and we won and the people got the money. So that's just a little highlight about how God can can work in your life. And I wish that our president and other and they may do this. I hope they do. See, you, you need some help when you're in these positions. I can guarantee you that you can't do it on your own. And it's all through the Bible where the Bible tells you to call on him. Back in the days when the, <coughs> excuse me, you looked at the wars that they had back in those days, none of those generals ever went to war before they would, first thing they would do is pray. Pray about, give me victory or whatever. See, I don't think we got much of that today. And I was just telling my Sunday school class, and it was in my reading, I'm going to share this, it's not, it don't have nothing to do with this, but I'm going to, I'm going to share it with the people because I want them to know where I'm coming from. Now see, I believe this because it's been in my Bible reading lately about the Sabbath day. See, the Sabbath day is really something with God because he mentions it 20 or 25 times in the Bible how important the Sabbath day was. Now somebody wanted to argue with you and say, well, what day is the Sabbath day? I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether it's Saturday or Sunday. That's not important. The Sabbath day, it could be Wednesday, but it's a Sabbath day. And he gives us that. To, to, we, we all, most Christians, believe it's, it's Sunday. And that's what we, it, it really doesn't matter. Just take a day that God, see, when he created this world, what did he do on the seventh day? He created it in six days and he rested on the seventh day. And he intends for us to do the same thing, that we're supposed to honor and serve and do nothing else. See, when I was a kid, they had what they call the blue laws. Nothing opened on so no businesses, no nothing. The blue laws. Well, and I use this term because most people can understand it, like getting your foot in the door. Just get your foot in the door. So when they were trying to get the devil's crowd, was trying to get rid of the Sabbath day, what did they do? Oh, well, people got to have bread and milk and these things. So why don't we just ex exclude them and let them sell bread and milk? Okay, getting your foot in the door. That's the devil getting your foot in the door. Well, the next thing, a couple of months later, well, people got to have gasoline. And so we need to let them sell gasoline, bread and milk. Foot in the door, door getting open a little while. First thing you know, everything is open today, but that's the devil's plan. But getting back to Baker and, and, and things that were going on back then, God, and, and I know it's him, it wasn't me because I'm not that smart, but he can make whoever he wants, he can make them as smart as he wants them to be. And he, I, I joke about this a lot of times, you know, the Bible says, keep your mouth shut. Don't be talked to, don't talk too much. See, because people may think you're smart if you don't say that, but you open your mouth and don't talk, they're going to see how stupid you are, how dumb you are. That's in the Bible. I don't, I hadn't listened to it, but that's in the Bible. So God helped me all the way through in my time in office. Uh, I didn't always live like he wanted me to live. Because see, you can get in those positions of authority. And I say this all the time. See, you see where public officials get into trouble. Uh, we've got some right here in Baton Rouge, some in Baker. You can stay in those offices so long that you begin to think it belongs to you. And that's when you mess up. See, you get used to people bowing and stooping when they're seeing you on the street and put you at the head table of everything they have. You drive those big SUVs and you pull into the service station, fill her up, Guy puts the gas in, you drive off, he makes a bill out to the city. 
so you can get used to that kind of stuff and you begin to think that that belongs to you and that has got a many a politician in big time trouble and that, that's me that's what I think that happened and I was right at that point see I had been in there nearly 25 years well longer than that because I had been a councilman for eight years and I began to feel myself sliding into that nobody can tell me nothing I know what I'm doing and you can get that state of mind and you can slip into that. Well, God protected me. He said, it's time for you to get out of that. Uh, you 100% of your retirement. I've been at that all those years. And uh, he said, it's time to move on. And that's when I decided not to run. Now, see, I had been the mayor since 64, but in uh, 76, I ran for mayor of Baton Rouge the first time. That was a grand against Woody. And when I got beat, I maybe didn't have a mayor because of the way the, the elections ran. Uh, so they were going to have a special election uh, to fill the vacancy. Because I didn't, I didn't run for re-election. My stock was high at that time. And, and I think I could have gotten real well. I, I proved it. Because when, uh, when I got beat, Baker had not replaced me yet. And they called a special election to fill my unexpired term. And, they, and when I got beat, they took me back. I didn't even have any opposition when I ran. Nobody would run against me. And so I went back into office, and, and that's when I served 10 more years. But uh, they had, and, and I was so fortunate. And, and this is a key. See, my mayor right now have got a situation going with the councilman. You, 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 you're just not man enough or woman enough to deal with a job like your personal problems, your, family, your constituents' problems, and then if you got a council that gives you problems, it's just more problems than you can handle. And I've said this before, 75%, my percentage in my mind, of councilmen want to be the mayor. Natural is breathing, and I know practically every mayor in the state I just left them up in Streetport. And they, have, they agreed with me. They said the same thing the mayor did. Every county, so when you got a situation like that, the councilmen start trying to undermine the mayor to make him look bad. And so they forget about who they really, they forget about the city in trying to make things progress. But I was so fortunate that I bet there well, had to be at least 25 or 30 council people that served while I was mayor, getting elected and getting beaten, different one. Some of my councilmen got beat, some of them got new councilmen. But I always had, a, uh, was so fortunate that I had council that, that, uh, that worked with me for the good of Baton, built that Civic Center, first one in East Baton Rouge Parish. It was an unbelievable deal, a little old city like that could get the people to vote a bond issue to build a, a Civic Center. And then I think of other things, how the town grew the city uh, subdivision. Baker in the early 60s was the fastest growing city in the state of Louisiana. That was record. I mean, Baker was just growing and mushrooming and things, good things were happening. And uh, I'm not trying to take the credit so good. They can come with the best idea they hear. And we'll just use Memory Park, for instance. I had very little to do with that memory park. But you know who got all the credit? The mayor. They don't even know who the council is. They, they have no idea what the council did. So you got to be able to handle those the kind of deal with it. And I think that's the reason why I'm, I'm back in there now. I, I feel like I can uh, do something that will help the, the mayor, some advice. I say, he'll tell me I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. I say, now wait just a minute. I say, now if you do that, this is going to happen. You're going to get beat on the head. So you better think about it. Because I said, I did the same thing and they beat me on the head. So you try to share with him things that happened to you. And I was so fortunate. When I, and I was a young man and I was so fortunate. I had an old man, his name was E.B. Prescott. He lived right in the house, yeah, the house right next door 
to First Baptist Church. It was three houses along there. Mr. Prescott, the Fairchild, and the church bought all of those properties later through the year. But Mr. Prescott had been on the council, but when I got elected mayor, I, 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 maybe Henry Smith, Henry Smith first gave Mr. Prescott the job as his administrative officer who would have run the city. And Mr. Prescott was, like I said, he was like a daddy to me, and he advised me about things I should or shouldn't do. And, uh, but he was, he was so loyal. I never will forget it because it caused me a lot of problems when I ran for mayor of Baton Rouge. Baker had a swimming pool. They were having problems with City Park Pool, Pearl George, and City End down there. And, and, but Baker had this pool. And so they decided, and that was only a couple of years old like, with the pool was there, but it was, no pool makes money. But the main thing was we were getting ready to see big time bad times in Baker. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan was involved, just like they had up there. The whites, the blacks were getting ready to fight, and we knew the, the, the Klan was very organized back then, especially in Baker. And we knew it was going to be bloodshed if we'd let that pool stay open. I was on the council, I wasn't a mayor. And so we closed the pool down, got rid of all of the crew, put a big, big hole back there at the end, right by that civic center we had just built. And Mr. Prescott was walking with me out there one morning. We were just looking the situation over. And uh, I shared it with him. I said, now, you know, I need to fill that pool up. I said, that thing is a hat. It was, it had been closed. And I'm going to tell you something else that you may not know. Uh, you know, back in those days, some of the secretaries would have a little goldfish bowl on their desk and they have a little goldfish in it that they'd feed along. Well, they would tell the custodian, get rid of them, or they're tired of feeding them. See, they say, get rid of them goldfish, I'm tired of them. So the custodian took them out there and threw them in that swimming pool. True story. And I'd read this or heard it before that. A goldfish would grow to the size of the body of water that you put him in. Look, when we when we dredged that swimming pool and got all the stuff before we filled it in, they had some two and a half pound goldfish in that thing. But anyway, I, I told Prescott, I said, uh, some some kid's gonna get drowned. I don't care whether he's white or black. You put a kid around water, and he gonna get in there some kind of way if he has to climb a fence. So I said, the best thing we need to do is just fill that thing up. I mean, within 20 minutes, those city trucks are back. Because Mr. Prescott said, if that's what you want to do, we'll do it. But there's so many crazy things that a young politician wanting to get his name out. And I tell Prescott, I said, let's do this. He said, no, let me, let me tell you. If that's what you want to do, I'm going to do it. But let me tell you first, if you do that, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. This is the stuff that I never thought about. And I said, you know, you, that's what dad is. Where dad is so important in raising a family. You've got to have that, to, that experience to share with your, your children you're raising up. So I listened to He was a blessing to me. Good guy. In fact, we named that court building back there, the E.B. Prescott Building, because he played a big part in the history of Bacon. And I think back of those old times. I think about Don Cockerham. I went the other day out to a little birthday party. Don is 94 now. Well, he was my administrative assistant for four or five years. Uh, he had been on the council. I think he had been my civil defense director. He, built, he and Ernest Dawson, back when I had that little old service station, it was the most modern station there. Well, they built a big, fine new Exxon station just south of me going to Ward Baton Rouge right on Highway 19. So it's funny how things happen in life. They were my big competitor, but we ended up being close friends and uh, he traveled the state with me a lot when I was running for Lieutenant Governor. And then I think old Chester moved on. Chester was on the council. He had 12 or 13 kids, I think. And his brother-in-law was a uh, police chief of New Iberia. Chester traveled a lot with me during that uh, campaign. And then old Horace Warmer. Horace was a guy that he liked controversy. 
he would stir up things even when everything was smooth. You've seen people like that. He couldn't stand it if everything ended up running against me. I never will forget that. He, I didn't have any opposition one time. So Horace said, man, you need, you need some competition. There's no way you stand. I said, no. If I don't have anybody running against me, I know where I stand. Well, he ran. And he had just made a million dollars. He was in the electrical business. He did the all electrical work on Sega Guyby down the river, down below uh, in Dallas. <coughs> made a ton of money. He made a, he made a million dollars. He had money. So he decided he was going to run against me. And uh, he did. Out signed me, out spent me. They had all kinds of little old parties and everything. And I beat him two to one. But anyway, we later we got to be friends. And he traveled and stayed with me in a Winnebago. He put money into my campaign when I ran for lieutenant governor. And uh, he's just another one of the Baker characters that we can we can talk about. Baker had so many people. Uh, I think about Sid Gotro, the sheriff now. Sid was young. He worked for the sheriff's office. And every time somebody that was going to run for office in Baker, they'd always come talk to me. And that's not a good place to be. Because no matter what advice you give him, if, he, if you give him advice, man, you ought to run it. You run and get beat, and he blamed you. So Sid came by to see me. We had a police chief, fine fellow, his name was Danny Ferguson. Danny was shot while he was the uh, police chief. Some thug shot him. And anyway, but Danny was a just a really nice, laid-back man, and he was, everything was going good. Well, Sid decided he was going to run for police chief. So he came by my office and he said, man, he said, look, I'm thinking about running for police chief. I said, well, Sid, I'm going to tell you, you got a hill to climb. I told him just like that. I said, Danny's a likable guy, but I said, look, I'm not telling you not to run, man, if you got the qualifying fee. And you're a good-looking young guy. You've been a, uh, a police officer. You've, you've been through Baker School. Your dad is in the electrical business. I said, I think you'll do well. And he ran. And he, got, he won. And uh, that started him on his way to, to being in there. But it was so many of those guys that ran. Some got beat, some didn't. I think of one guy, he was, a, he was a good guy, he was on the council for a long time. His name was John Walden, and uh, so at election night I think he got beat, and he blamed me for getting beat, and he, I can, his wife's name was Shirley, they're both dead now. Their daughter's still living, a good friend of mine, but uh, he called me to tell me, to blame me for, get, for him getting beat. I could hear his wife talking in the background, telling him what to say. I said, John, put the phone. Give the phone to your wife. Let me, t let me talk to her. I don't need to talk to you. But anyway, that's just a little side light that we had there. But I had so many good years and went on. We're going to take a break. You're going to cut? Mm -hmm. We're going to take a break. All right. Okay, we'll come back. I'm, if the camera's, if the camera's tired out, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to keep going? Yeah, let me okay. keep going. All right, go ahead. Okay, well, but because uh, I'm I'm getting close to where we are now, anyway. I've had so many wonderful experiences. I I got into municipal association in 1957. I was elected in '56, and that's when Baker became a member. Uh, as far as politically, it was a, a really good thing for me because I got known all over the state. I, I was, I got, like I said, I became a member in 57, and in 67 I was elected president. Now that's all of the mayors and the councilmen, district attorneys and all these in the state. Just had our convention up in Freeport, with 1,500 people there. But uh, being, being in there, and I used this term a while ago, it put me into the mainstream of politics. Uh, the governor appointed me to to represent local and parochial government. And this is something that, that my name may be not mentioned anywhere else, but it'll be mentioned as being a delegate to the Constitutional Convention, which uh, drafted, it took us a year to draft the Constitution, which is like the Bible for the state. 
that tells you what you can and what you can't do and I'm this kind of stuff. So that's a history thing that I got involved in because of my relationship in the uh, LMA. And then getting to know mayors front. I know every mayor in this, if I don't know them, they know me. Uh, every, every mayor and the councilman in the state. I never think, forget about when I was running for lieutenant governor. New Iberia had just built oh, just a fabulous city hall on Bayou Tech. Right on the right on the bayou. Well Alan Day was the mayor. Wealthy, good guy, man, good mayor. And he was supporting me. So I I, I used to go by his house, big old mansion over there, and, and have lunch with him when I was running. And so I was traveling in this winter babe. I didn't have any money. The only, me and my kids and the rest of the traveling state in that old Winnebago. And I pulled into New Iberia in the, in the Winnebago and I told the mayor, I said, look man, where's a good place I can, where's a trailer park or somewhere I can park this uh, motor home tonight? He said, man, pull that thing over there by that city hall. Boy, big old Fonzie hit an outside plug. I put that, plug that thing into that city hall. He, he man, look, he, he run that show over there. And so my, my troops or whoever was traveling with me, the kids or whoever, were able to stay in that motor home there. But it was so many experiences. I never will forget. Boy, I think about this and I, I, what, what fun, what experiences. When I was running for Lieutenant Governor, I was in, uh, uh, wait a minute. Oh, the guys, he's still a man. I'll think of it in a minute. <clears throat> but it's a town down there that I had been invited to speak. Now this was on a Sunday morning, talking about the Sabbath day. This was on a Sunday morning. It was in a ballroom. Little kids were playing, but that's a culture down there that uh, it, it, nobody thought anything about it. And I never will forget it. It was three or four candidates, Jimmy Fitzmaurice and uh, Vadreen from Bill Platt and a guy from up in North Louisiana that was a very powerful thing. They were all running at the same day. Jimmy Fitzmaurice ended up winning because uh, he was from out of New Orleans. We got to be good friends too. He's 93 or 4 and like I was picked as a People's Health Champion, Jimmy Fitzmaurice is a People's Health Champion. And we were having our annual dinner out at the Lakefront Airport when they just remodeled it. I, think, I don't know whether Kathy was with me. One of my kids were with me though, because they'd go every time. And old Jimmy was there, and we, we visited. But getting back to, uh, it wasn't gate on, it was, God, dog, and I see this mayor all the time. But we were there and we were speaking. Well, people, people around here know me, but you get off over there, they don't know you. And so this master of ceremonies was having a hard time saying Heine, because so many people think it's a bad word. And so he, he called me everything but what mama named me. So I never will forget this. I finally did my little talk, and there was a woman standing down at the steps when they come down off the little podium, and she was waiting for me. And she did like this. And she said, come here, Mayor. She said, look, the next time you go to speak somewhere, you tell that guy, whoever introduced you, woman, man, whoever was, that introduced you, say, my name is Heine, Heine. And she turned around and she patted her butt and said, tell him, it's easy to remember because everybody's got one. So, so I thought of that many times during the camp. I tell that a lot of times to people, but that's another experience that you had. And then, like I say, traveling in that Winnebago, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, well, I know we were in the Winnebago, but you remember when they, they had that uh, Muslim down there on North Boulevard when Eddie Bauer and a couple of Baton Rouge policemen got a couple of them lived there in Baker? Well, it was happening, and we were on our way back. Kathy was with us. We were on our way back in that Winnebago. So they called me and said, look, don't come into Baton Rouge. We want 190 to come over the old river because they knew I, had, I was going to go over the river. And on the side of that, Winnebago was, was peak, pistol peak. 
and see marriage was at his very height. And, that, and we had the same number. My, my political number and marriage's uh, basketball number were the same thing. And we had that painted on there and said, Pistol Pete. And it was right, the whole side of that Winnebago. So they called and said, don't come into Baton Rouge, we're gonna have a police escort to meet you on the other side of the river and bring you on through, especially coming through Scotlandville. And so that was another one of those things that, that just in your memory. And then I think back about old Bill Bradley. Uh, Bill was my city attorney and we were close, we were buddies, we were friends. And uh, <coughs> Bradley had an airplane. So he had had a, a, a case over in Opelousas and he flew over there. He had a little old Mooney, low wing plane, and I was learning how to fly about that time. And I was flying those little old Cessnas 152 to get my license. And so Bradley got weathered in, and so he, he called me, he said, look, what you doing? I said, man, just sitting around. And he said, well, look, can you run over here? Can you fly me over to Opelousas. He said, you got your license yet? I said, no, but I'm getting close. And he said, well, you can fly. I could fly without a license at the point I was then if you went, if you had a pilot in the plane with you. So I said, yeah, man. Well, most of my buddies drank. I didn't, but they did. And we were headed out to the airport to get that little 152. And they, they remodeled that station down there in Scotlandville, right where Thomas Road turns off to go by, by the airport. And so Brad said, stop over there, man. And he got him a six pack. And he put that thing between, put him between his feet. And so we took off, and he was drinking on the way to Alvalusa. Well, we got, I didn't even turn my motor engine off. I just dropped him out, and he got out, went and got in that Mooney, and took off. Well, I'd already taken off, and I'm a, I'm a, I was a white knuckle pilot, because man, when that plane would do anything, man, my, you could see the white of my knuckles, you know, and so I'm sitting there looking straight ahead, probably over Morgan's or someplace, getting ready to land in, in uh, Ryan Field, and I look out the corner of my eye and caught something that was Brad, Bradley. He, that Mooney had caught up with me, and look, he'd been drinking that six pack. And when he when he when he passed me, he, he flipped me the bird. <laughs> he passed me, give me the bird, and he he landed out there before I did. But I, I love Bill Bradley. We we had so many good times together. And he barely died. He was he was getting close to ninety. He had moved to uh, Destin, Florida. Uh, in fact, we went over there to his funeral. Jim Gebhardt and uh, John Butler who was our uh, auditor, and Glenn was the president of the Louisiana National Bank, and I put him on two or three different committees. So it was those kind of relationships that we made. And you know what's the thing? You know Georgia was not a society, especially if there was alcohol or anything around. Uh, she, uh, she just didn't play those games, you know. And so we wasn't in society people. All of our friends, they had parties and drank. They got the way they wouldn't invite me because they knew I wasn't going to come. And, but yet we were all still close, all still friends. And uh, I think about old Bradley and them and Dr. Johnson. Dr. Johnson was my pal. Same thing with him. Most of them were Catholic. But we were friends and we respected, we liked each other. Liked to be around, liked to play golf. When I played golf, I couldn't stand to play golf with somebody that I really didn't care for. Uh, it, it, I didn't hate them, but I just didn't like to be around them. And I couldn't enjoy my golf, but when I played with my friend, it was fun. We'd joke and carry on and tell stuff. And a lot of that kind of stuff that, uh, that uh, I didn't, you know, we just didn't involve. In fact, one of the things that I think about uh, that, that was a big deal in Baker. I don't know if it still is or not, it was a carnival ball. You know I've never been to a carnival ball now, I was a man, and my kids have been to them, but I had never been to one. 
And I'm going to take a little break, but I'm going to tell you this before I do it. And the reason why, I never would go back to when Daddy was a pastor of First Baptist. But right after he got there, they had the big carnival ball. That was before we had the Civic Center. It all took place over at this gym at the high school. And he was drinking and carrying on and dancing and carrying on there at the, at, at the school, on the school property. And Daddy preached a sermon about it. And I was there. And I guess that's the reason why I never got involved. I had so much respect for my daddy. Uh, and, and when he said this, I just knew it was something I was not going to do out of respect for him. One last thing, I had that service station, which I talked. I never will forget it. I was under a car because I did everything. I was under a car breathing that thing. And I couldn't, I had my head up under there and I had a cigarette in my mouth. And uh, I, I was, I, I, knew, I knew a car had pulled in up there. And this boy said, hey Pete, and boy was daddy. I wouldn't have let my daddy see me smoking for nothing in the world. And look, <laughs> I'd love to have it on candid camera. I'm standing up under that tree in that car. And look, I had that cigarette in my mouth, and I took my tongue, and I kind of bit it. It fell out there on the floor. Daddy knew I was smoking because he could smell the smoke. But I was not going to let, out of respect for him, I was not going to let him see me smoke. We're going to take a quick break. Okay, you know it may be some things that would be interesting to people that have just moved in the last few years to Baker. You know where CVS Pharmacy is? That was the Knapp Brown's mother's old home. It was bought by Susie Gotro family, who were the days I mentioned them early on. And they moved that house, big, big house. Uh, I had a mayor's office in there because that was the city hall. The first city hall was right in behind it, which is where the drive-in for CVS is today. It was a little block building, and we later added on a fire station to that building. We ran the utility office there. Our water tank for Baker was a, a tank car, a railroad tank car. And I never will forget it because it my only fame to glory was You'd see those in little towns around where tank cars had been cleaned out and water, they were used for water tank, but it was at ground level. But they mounted that thing into two big concrete slabs about that right, like this, with, but like a U. U and that tank sat on, one on each end sat there, and that's where we got our water from. Well, when we built the fire station, the original fire station, uh, we had bought the water system out and we had elevated tanks. So we had to get rid of the tank. We didn't have any problems getting rid of the tank. We had a number of people that bid to buy it. But we were left with those two big U's, concrete that wide, and trying to decide what to do with it. What the council was talking about, I was on the council. And I said, why don't we just dig a big hole and bury it? And that's what we did, and those things are right there now, where that CVS drive right underground, where we buried those two things. But uh, when we when we started to get a volunteer fire department, we didn't have a truck, didn't have anything. We talked Mayor Dumas, Woody Dumas was a councilman at the time from East Baton Rouge Pair, and they had a small old fire truck out at Ryan Field. Harding Field, as it's called then. And Woody gave us that thing, and we had to outfit it, but had a number of volunteers. I can see their face and that. Boy, they'd come out to work you know, over there and work on the fire thing. But if you had a fire, you'd have to call Pete Hines his Ezra. I was the only guy in town, really. Everybody else worked with the only businessman. So we kept the fire truck at my service station, and if you had a fire, you'd call the service station, and. Sometimes I went to fires by myself. Sometimes I'd have women helping me because that was all it was in town. But the fire department is, a, is something now. And we, we started with that. And I think about those guys and 
uh, I was talking earlier about uh, Mayor Smith being locked up. We were going to buy our first fire truck, and uh, we had a bid out of a guy out of Mississippi, and then we had a bid from uh, Musa, Musa Fire Equipment Company out of Crowley. And the Musa later on became to be the mayor. He never let me forget this <laughs> after he got to be the mayor. But uh, I paid the old political game on the fire truck. Well, the guy, the, the bid from Mississippi was less than the bid that uh, Musa gave. So, you know, I did, well, this is taxpayers' money. We got to do what's right. Well, we bought the one from Mississippi rather than buying the one from Musa. He never let me forget it. That was a white fire truck. You see a lot of them now, but that was the first white fire truck in the whole area. Most fire trucks were red. But anyway, that was our first fire truck, and Baker went on to get a class two through the years, upgrading our water system and things like that. But that that's where Baker really came from, getting back to the old house where the, the second city hall was, was, was the old brown house, which they moved out. And that's when we built the big fire station. If you remember, and this was just before it was sold to CBS was a, the original fire station. We kept adding to that thing. That that was a meeting place for everything. It the, the the men built this. Not we didn't contract it out or anything. Just the volunteers built it. And he had a nice uh, banquet room up above uh, the lower section. And everything that took place in Baker back then that was before the Civic Center would be right there. I can remember Jimmy Davis and his band practicing up over at fire station. We all got to be buddy-buddy with him. And in fact, when I ran for lieutenant governor, uh, the girl that, that practiced with the band was named uh, Peggy Foreman. She went on to Nashville to, uh, and got pretty famous, same with Conway Twitty. Her husband wrote that song I don't know, some people got these little 45s. I've been, I had a few left and I've been giving them to people where uh, it was a song, Let's Elect Pete Heine. And it was the tune of Jambalana. It's a catchy, catchy little old song. And, uh, but that was done at the fire station. Uh, the, the recording was. And then, then we went on to uh, something that I, I want to check. When, when we talked about it, Baker had on one stoplight, and that was at Groom Road. I had the service station, which was two blocks north on 19. And I mean, I went to work at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I stayed there till 8 o'clock at night. Well, we had that one light, but it wasn't automatic like they are today. Not near about right like they are. But it had a big switch box there. And so DOTD gave me a key to that box. And when I would come to work in the morning, it, well, what you do, it was such a small amount of traffic, you didn't want that thing stopping people in the middle of the night, you know, while they're traveling. So uh, rather than having an automatic switch that would turn it from blink to where it was working, I had the key, and when I would come to work in the morning, I'd turn it on where it would give you, red, you know, your red, regular cycle, red and green. Well, when I'd go home at 8 o'clock at night, I'd open that box and I'd turn it off, where it would just be yellow blinking <laughs> to that. Another side, Baker didn't have garbage pickup. One garbage truck from the city parish ran down Groom Road. So, I, George and I lived back in, in Bakerfield. There was about seven houses back there then. Mine was one of the first ones built. And I had the service station. And so I was a garbage man. I had a pickup truck. Everybody put their garbage to seven houses, put their garbage out just like you were waiting for the garbage. I'd pick them up, put them in the back of my pickup truck, and take them out to the groom, to the corner of groom road there by the, by the lake. I'd bring them in the morning. When I'd come home at night, I knew who can was what. I put them up in the back of that truck. I guess that's how I stayed in the office. People felt, felt some obligation to me anyway. But that's some of the older things that, uh, that happened 
during the early years, and those were such good years, golly. When I think about it, now, I guess I'm just getting older and, and can appreciate those kind of things. Never will forget Judge Steen, Stein, Steen. He was a bankruptcy, federal bankruptcy judge for the Baton Rouge area, whatever it is. So he calls me one day. We had the cemetery had been built uh, by Banner and a fellow by the name of Cotton uh, put in that cemetery. Uh, the McCollises was in some way, Sam Gallo, our cousin, worked for him, I think. But they put that cemetery together and boy, it was, a, it was just such a fine thing for Baker. And, but the business wasn't what they thought it was, maybe something else. But they, you, I use the term belly up, they went belly up. And the, the federal court took control of the thing. And so Judge Dean called me one day and he said, Mayor, look, he said, I got an offer you can't refuse. I said, what's that, Judge? He said, I want you to take over that cemetery down there. I said, Judge, look, this is, it, it, to me, it's not compatible with, with government, I said. Uh, man, that, you, you fool with people's dead body. They're going to really be on your case if you don't do something right. He said, but I want you to do it. I said, well, you the judge. So the best I can remember, he gave us, gave Baker $300,000 cash, gave us all of the rest of the unused plots, but we had to assume the debt of those people that had bought pre need and it's called Baker some problem. It did, you, you don't see these kind of things when they're happening. But when it wasn't that, it was a good deal when we took it over. But we wasn't thinking about inflation. So a guy buys pre needs back 15 or 20 years ago, he paid $500 for it. Today, to, to the same thing, $5,000 to, to furnish those needs. But they're gonna, it's, it's going to survive, and the city owns it. I never will forget, uh, in that bankruptcy, it was maybe 30 or 40 or 50, I don't know exactly how many acres it was, but behind the cemetery that joined it. But it was a separate deal. The Small Business Administration had the mortgage on that. And so uh, somebody told said, well, you, you got the property landlocked, you ought to buy it. So I call it old boy down at uh, Small Business, he's a black guy, Small Business Administration in New Orleans. And I, he said, yeah, he said, we, man, we'd love for Baker to buy that thing. And he gave me a price, I gave him a price. And we signed off on it. I mean, we signed the group, we were going to pay him like $100,000 a year or something. Until, until the city owned it. And I was sitting there, I was shaving one morning, and I just, something just told me, said, that's not a good deal. And so, uh, he said, the property's landlocked, nobody else can do anything with it except the city with the cemetery. So, <laughs> I called Jim Hill, who was a great councilman for Baker. He's the head of the Franklin finance now, a big deal, he's a big deal. He calls me every now and then and we communicate, but he was a smart, smart guy. And I, he's a lot younger than I was, but I would depend on him a lot. Uh, when you're not the smallest, the, the, I'm the smallest, but not the smartest guy, you try to find people that's, that you think are smarter than you. So I called Jim and I told him, he said, well, whatever you think, he said, I said, look, it's not a good deal. I said, an old Bill Bradley, who I mentioned a while ago, and when he drew up that mortgage, uh, your husband might know, uh, uh, Darlene, Steve, it's called an in-ram mortgage, where you don't give the full faith and credit of the city. You have a mortgage, but the property stands for the prop for it. In other words, if, if something happens and you can't pay it, they don't go against the city's finances, they go against it, they take the property. And old Bradley did that thing. It was one of those things again, where I guess where God just had his hand on my head. So, and I knew that. So I, <laughs> after I got through shaving, I called Jim Hill. I, 
I called that guy in New Orleans. I said, hey, man, brother. I said, hey, brother. I said, this the mayor. Hey, hey, mayor, how you doing? How's everything going? How's the problem? I said, everything's fine, but I got a problem. He said, what's the problem? I said, the problem is I paid you too much for that problem. And I started telling him about the land like, oh, mayor, no, no, mayor. You, you got a good deal? I said, nope. I said, brother, you're wrong. I said, it's not a good deal. Well, what you want me to do? I said, I said I'm going to give it back to you. I said, you can't get my city money because it's an in ram mall. You, all you can do is get your property back. And we're going to lose maybe $50,000. Oh, man, he said, look, he said, look, look, look. Make me an offer. So I said, I'm going to give him an offer that I know he's going to turn down. And I did. It was about a tenth of what that property was worth. Boy, you hard, you hard, man. I said, well, man, I got to look out for that tax bill money. And so they accepted it, and that's how they got that property. But uh, it may not now. They, what happened in, to the cemetery, because right now, in that stipulation, when you sell a person a service, to burial and all this kind of stuff. Like I said a while ago, maybe $500 or $5,000. You are by law, supposed, when it's a perpetual cash cemetery, you are supposed to put a percentage of that money in an escrow. Just like you do if you buy a house and you put the insurance, they escrow it. Well, somewhere down the line, they, didn't, they hadn't been putting the money in there. And that's what's caused them some big time problems. But I think, we, I think it's going to get worked out. But uh, the cemetery is, a, is something that needs to be in the city. You know, I worked very hard with Cecil Graves for Graves Chevrolet to get that dealership in Baker because there's things, I think, mindset with people that you're supposed to have in a community. You need a good school, you need churches, you need grocery stores, you need different things, and one thing that Baker didn't have, but all these other smaller cities around, was a car dealership. Well, Mullen Graves was having problems with, uh, with the new, they call it the new, uh, new Car Dealers Association, which is composed of the dealers. Well, if I'm a Chevrolet dealer, and another Chevrolet dealer wants to come in, and I got to vote whether we're going to let him in or not. Well, how do you think I'm going to vote? I'm going to vote to not let him in. Well, that's what they were doing to Merlin. So Merlin called me. He said, well, he said, look, we're going to make one more pitch at the New Core Dealers Association to try to get that permit. He said, uh, would you go down there with me and Wade shows, my good little buddy who just died here, uh, just a couple of months ago, Wade, uh, Wade was just a good, good friend. And Wade was an attorney for the new car dealers, or not for, yeah, for the car dealers association. So Merlin asked me if I'd go to New Orleans with him and Wade to appear before the new car dealer. And I said, yeah, I'll go down there. Well, I made this song and dance about every city needs a dealership, you know, all these other dealers had turned it down. While well, we were still there, I never will forget. We was on our way back from New Orleans. We stopped at the Heidelberg Hotel and had dinner, and we was on our way back. I'm sitting in the back with my head between the two guys up front, where I could hear. And so the governor, Merlin, said, "You know the governor?" I said, "Yeah." He said, "Would you call him and ask him if he?" That was Edward, Governor Edward and uh, asked him if he could give us any help in this thing. I said, I'll give it a try. I said, I'm not going to promise you nothing, but I'll try. So I got back and I called a mansion. And most of those troopers knew me. And uh, I said, I need to talk to the governor. I said, he's here? Yeah, he's here. So they put me on hold of me and he come on, Pete, what you got? And I told him, I said, man, this man got all his business straight with Chevrolet with GMC or GM or whoever they are. And yet your, your, your commission won't give him the <laughs> Let me see what I can do. True story. 
9 o'clock the next morning, the secretary from the new car dealerships called Wade and said, come get your permit. Now that's how powerful the government is. And that's how everyone ever, they can say what they want to about it. And, but I'm telling you what, he, when he said he was going to do something, he did it. Trine was one of the finest men I ever knew. But you'd ask him to do something. Let me check into it, Pete. I'll, I'll get back with you. And the deal would be gone by the time he'd call you back. But Edwin Edwards now, he was a friend to local government. Whatever else he did, now that, now I have no, but I can tell you one thing. And I called him a number of times to help the city of Baker. And he would always do what he could do. Uh, so anyway, let me see. I got me a note here. First note I've had, I've been doing all this talking without any note. Told you about the cemetery. There was a lady in Baker that had been my friend for years. In fact, she was on my first uh, prayer breakfast committee. She was the head lady at the old Louisiana National Bank. Her son was Randy Herring, who was a star basketball player, if y'all remember, from Baker. Because I used to tell people all over the state, Randy Herring from Baker. He might have played during Pete's time, I don't know. But anyway, that Norma's daughter, she, she, she fed me after Georgia passed away and uh, I'd be sitting there at the house and Norma would call over there and say, you got anything to eat? And I said, I'd be sitting there eating and I'd say, not a thing. And so she said, come, come stop by, I got you some chicken and dumplings or something. And, uh, I really miss talking to her because we, we both had been around a long time and knew a lot of people in Baker and, and she, was just, she was just a really good person. It was a real shock when she passed away a couple of months ago. In fact, I did a eulogy at a funeral. Uh, she, she helped people. I wasn't the only person in Baker she fed. Now for a while I thought I was, but it, I found out quick she fed everybody. So anyway. Uh, I did a eulogy, but it was such a shock. They, the doctor just mis misdiagnosed what her problem was. She just got to feeling bad and she called. And she, she, when she got to where she just wouldn't take phone calls, I knew she was real sick and she was bouncing around. And, did, and this only went on for about three weeks and she was dead. It seemed like she had something with her kidneys that were blocked up and doctor. Doctor just didn't find it, but she's part of Baker history, did a lot of things through the bank to help uh, Baker, served on a bunch of different committees. Like I said, she was, she was on my first prayer breakfast committee, and that's a, that's a little history too. See, this is how God can use you to do His will. I had been invited to the presidential prayer breakfast in Washington, I think because I was president of the Louisiana Municipal Association. And uh, uh, George and I went. We flew up there. I told her, I said, we ought to go to that thing. So she and I flew up there. And I was so stupid. Uh, when I think back on it, George had never been to Washington. And uh, we went up there to the prayer breakfast, got on that plane and flew right on back after the prayer breakfast. When I really should have stayed up there maybe another day and taken her around and show her different things. But that's stupid stuff that you, you just don't think about at the time. But I remember coming back on the plane, I, I, I told George, I said, you know, if the president can have a prayer breakfast and the governor can have, why can't a mayor have one? And so I came back, I called Norma and others and got them to serve. Well, look, we had some dynamite once through the year. It'd be, it was not unusual to have six or seven hundred people there. Just had some, I had governors speak, different ones. I remember one guy was a, a Marine veteran, had no legs. I can't think of his name. Boy, but he was a dynamite guy. We built, we built all, and I'm th when I say no legs, I'm thinking about no legs at all. All the way up as high as they go. He had no leg. And we built all kind of handicap ramps around there for him at City Hall. Shoot, that guy got around better than all of it. I mean, he just, 
he just got a, had a dynamite message. But that was one of the ones that really stick out in my mind. And I give the mayor that, that followed me credit because every one of them continued that prayer break. Just had the one here uh, in July the 31st, or June the 1st, that's our fiscal year. So it's still going on today. That's another thing of, of, about Baker. History. Let's see, home. Oh, the catamount. You know, when you got five kids, active kids, you got all kinds of stuff going on at your house. And when we had four boys, we had them girls. I had more girls up at the house than I had boys because they was over there because of the boys. But anyway, they would be bad at the house. And we had all kinds of pets, man. It, I don't know where I got that thing from, but, but it was a spider monkey. I bought the cage and the monkey, too. So we brought the cage and had him out there. And they, they named him Pete. He, he was a little spider monkey. I don't know if you've ever seen one. A little, little old thing, but we kept him in that cage. And man, we didn't have a zoo back then, but we had a zoo in my house. And the kids in the neighborhood was all wanting to come over there and see Pete the monkey. And uh, so some, one of the kids decided we'd bring him in the house. And that thing got a loose, and I'm looking at these drapes and stuff in here. We, we tried to catch him with nets and everything else. But that thing would get in him drapes and jump around. He'd jump half across the room. But we had more fun. We, we buried him out there in the back. Uh, but the kids would come over there. We had Shetland Pony. We had, uh, I, I may have told y'all this last time, when I was in the Constitutional Convention, Shalom Perez from Plaquemine Parish, you know, Judge Perez, owned everything down there. Well, Shalom was the chairman of our committee, and he said, look, I want to take you to D.C. Egyptian when the convention's over. So he took about three of us, picked me up in the seaplane out there at Baton Rouge Airport, old, down, old airport out on Florida Street, where the police headquarters are, and a, a McDermott seaplane picked me up out there, and we flew down to the mouth of the Mississippi River. They had a little uh, the, uh, New Orleans big game camp. Boy, it was fun. Those big uh, liners, uh, pass, we passed there when we went on a cruise ship. We passed there when George and I went on a cruise. I, I, I pointed out to her, I said, there's that camp, right there when we were going out to go cruising. So anyway, flew down there, that, we fished, had one boat that went way out in the blue water, they call it, lock, yacht-like, and then another one, and Shalom says, I want you to go on this one. I did, and boy, we caught more fish. And he put a little old Frenchy guy with me and took me into those jetties down there where we fished. Man, we caught them pecs and you know, white trout and everything else. Man, they packed, they cleaned them things, put them in a nice jet. But I kept telling Shalom, I said, man, look, I got to be back in Baker in the morning. This was Saturday. I said, I got to be, this was Friday, I was telling me. I said, man, I got to be back in Baker. That's the first pitch. I pitched out the first ball at the Little League. And I said, they are looking for me. I got to be there. I keep, don't worry about it. Go enjoy yourself. Don't worry about it. I was worried about it. And I kept on telling him, I said, yeah. Don't worry about something else. Man, I'm worried about it. I said, that's my job security. I said, I got to be back. Look, I got up Saturday morning, and I looked out there on the dock, and boy, there was a, a black jet helicopter sitting right there, belonged to the parrot. And he said, all right, load up, little man. He said, I'm gonna get you back to Baker. I never will forget this pilot's name was Black. And with us was Boise Bollinger, who was a young boy about 18 years old that was on the Constitutional Convention. Bollinger Shipyard just passed through it the other day, on half the world down there. And then uh, uh, Charlie Pasqua. And we, so we got over Gonzales, good Malugan. Man, it didn't take us an hour or less to come from the mouth of the Mississippi River to Baker. Well, 
That's why I lived in a subdivision, but it was a dead end street. We landed in the middle of that dead end street. He jumped out of that helicopter and went on off. We landed at Boise Ballinger's shipyard and cut off. We landed in the parking lot out the past the other day and showed it to this guy that was with me. And then he brought me to Baker. And so we come over to Baker and he said, but where do you want to put you off? I said, well, I got a pasture back there, but I said, got all them for contrary. I said, you might not be. He, so he got down a little low. He said, I, I can, I said, now don't take no chances. I said, we can go over there to the shopping center and you can drive. He said, no, I can make it. Boy, he put that thing down there. And I don't know if you've ever paid attention to a helicopter when it's sitting, whoop, 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 whoop. Drew every kid in back. got around my fence to look at that helicopter in that backyard. So I told old Black, I said, you want a Coke or something? He said, yeah, I might, do. yeah. So we would still walk, walk. So I went and got him a Coke, and my boys were there, the four of them. And they bought their eyes was about this big. And so I said, are you in a hurry? He said, not really. He said, I'm just flying back to Clapham Parish. And uh, I said, you don't have to take them anywhere. I said, just let them get in and raise them up above them trees, and that'll be good. Oh, yeah, man, ain't no problem. So the four boys got in there. He took them up, boy, he started. He gave them a tour of bacon coming. Look, when he put that thing down, I looked out there. And then four boys got out of that helicopter, and Travis went, who, <laughs> black guy, that mom and him practically raised him. He knew everybody in Baker. And so, so Travis jumped in that helicopter and went with him. So he left, and I didn't think any more about it until a newspaper came out. The Baker Observer came out the next week, and a big headline, Travis Wynn tours Baker in helicopter. I said, man, hey, that's another highlight of a little town and it, but it, it was some kind of fun, I'm telling you. But he made them little boys happy and them too. And uh, you know, I've talked about everything except my kids. And we might just end up with this because I think we've got COVID every time. Darlene go, she ain't gonna do this no more if I take too much time. But you know, we were so blessed. George and I had been married 10 months, I think, when Kathy was born. And I said this, and in fact, we were in a little old rent house on Groom Road, and it flooded the other day again. We're back in my day, just a block up from the high school. We were in a little old house, $50 a month from Mr. Paul Daniels when we were there. And O.C. Brown's daddy, old Mr. George Brown, he, boy, he thought George was the prettiest thing he'd ever seen. And so the, the little old house didn't have no cabinet where you could put dishes and stuff in it. And so Mr. Brown came down there and built Georgia some cabinet in that little old house. And so that's where we were living when she was expecting Kathy. But it flooded every time, he, every time it rained. And I had bought this big old Buick when I got out of the service. And I had a truck for the service station. And the car would be on the carport. And I'd come in with the truck and park in behind the car. And it started raining. And Georgia would say, you better go move that truck so you can take that car up to the school ground and park it up at the high school up on the high ground. I mean, it didn't take a whole lot of rain to flood that place. But I mean, it come right up to the bottom. I wonder how it didn't float. Never got in it, but it come right up to the bottom of it. So uh, that's where we were living. And we made one of those aborted trips uh, the night she, I took her to the hospital, Dr. Mullen in Baton Rouge was her doctor, and we took her to the Baton Rouge General. And uh, it was a false alarm. We came on back home. Had just got to sleep, and I mean, they had to turn right around and go back down there. And that's when Kathy was born. And I said this at the last time I talked to her. I was so disappointed. I wanted, a, I wanted a boy so bad. And Bubba had already had either three or I think four uh, girls, three, had three. 
And uh, man, I say, ain't no, ain't no hope for these hyenas. We, we ain't gonna have nothing but girls. And boy, I, but see, God has a way of punishing. I said this in the, one of these tapes I did, that uh, after Kathy was born, then we had four boys. When we was born a girl. So that's the way he pays you back. And then comes along Steve. All our kids were about a little over two years or close, maybe less than both. The Shuck and Steve was about a year. But anyway, it was Steve. And he was born at the old Lady Lake Hospital. And I remember, you could, back in those days, you could see Memorial Stadium from the Baton Rouge. We was up on the upper floor. And I think they were having a circus there or something in on the football field, and we watched it. But what I think most about Steve was at the old hospital. Dr. Mullins was his doctor too, I believe. And Camille Jett was a nurse. They lived in Baker. And you will know her name when I mention it. If you remember when Earl Long went crazy and he traveled around the state, uh, none of y'all are old enough to remember it, but they trying to put him in an insane asylum, but he traveled around the state, <laughs> not in the fruit cake. And it made a big deal out of it. He had a mystery nurse traveling with him. Mystery, not miss, not his mistress, but she was a mystery. They didn't know who she was. Well, that nurse was Camille Jet. That's the one that brought Steve out of that delivery room in the Lay the Lake Hospital, and I was outside, and she said, you got that boy. I remember, I can hear right now, you got that boy. And it was Steve. Steve had the most beautiful hair you have ever seen on a human being. His hair was gold colored, and it was ringlets, just like women put their hair on. His was ringlets, and we, it was a long time before we cut his hair, it was so pretty. And we took him up to Manny, where one of George's uh, cousins was a barber, and he cut Steve's hair the first time. Chuck, Chuck came along, a year later. And Dr. Hobgood, who was a doctor in Baker, was the one that, uh, their doctor. And he and I had been to the football jamboree back in Baker's day when they were whipping everybody. Well, everybody went to the ball game. Well, Dr. Hobgood and I went to the game together. It was at Memorial Stadium. So we got home, and he lived about five houses past us on Magnolia Drive. And he dropped me off at the drive, off the in the house. And when I got in the house, Georgia was in the bathtub. And I stuck my head in the door, and, and I said, what's, what's the matter? And she was crying. She said, just leave me alone. <laughs> and when Georgia said, leave her alone, you left her alone. But I went in there and I called Mama, because they were still living in Baton Rouge. And I called Mama, I said, y'all better head on up here, because I think Georgia's getting ready to have that baby. Well, they started on up here. Well, in the meantime, she got out of the bathtub and laid on the bed. Now, y'all know I'm a little guy, but I was going to be big until I had that experience. It was me and Jordan and Chuck. I went in there. I bet you I run out to the end of that driveway 50 times looking to see, because I called Dr. Hollywood. His wife's name was Florence. And I said, Florence, is Leslie there? She said, no. Nope. said he went to the football stadium to check on the team, which he always did to see if any of them got hurt anything. And they don't have a phone over there. Boy, I kept running out to the end of that driveway to see if he was there. And finally, he came down to the house and he walked in there to Georgia, where she was. And he told me, he said, go put three or four pillars in the back of your car because we're going to take her on up to the house, take her to the hospital. And then I got the pillars and I come back. He said, never mind. He said, go pick up Miss Morton. She was his nurse, and she lived over by where we live now. And so I went and picked up Miss Morton and brought her over there. 
So he asked me, he said, have you got any, have you got a white shoestring here? I said, the only one I got is in them tennis shoes. He said, get it. He told me the morning, he said, boil it. That's what they tied the biblical cord off with a white shoestring. And you know, I guess this is natural. I don't know. I know it is with cat. You got afterbirth when a baby's born. And they took that afterbirth and went out there and buried it in the backyard, right there on Magnolia Drive. Put the order down to bed. Dr. Highgood asked me this morning, he said, can you spend, mom and dad had already got there. So they were there. And so he asked Ms. Morton, he said, can you spend the night with them? And she said, yeah, I'd be glad to do it. Now, you're not going to believe it. There was Ms. Morton, there was mom and daddy, and there was me. Georgia picked our breakfast the next morning. Now, if you think that's not a superwoman, she was. She got up there, had that baby chuckle, just a fine baby. I pat him on the head till today because we never had a hospital bill. The only thing I had, I think the doctor bill back then was about $150. And so all I had to, and he took that out and gas. <laughs> I had that sort of thing. And he used to buy gas from me and wouldn't pay me. I'd have to done it. And so, but I said, I paid for old Chuck with 10 gallons of gas, I reckon. But that was just another. And then Scooter, Scooter came along and Scooter was one of the first baby to be born in Lane Hospital. It was it was very few. It, 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 it probably the only patient. And Georgia just had a a perfect birth. I mean she just had scooter and then and, and, and me like everybody else when you when you get them kids you done bought yourself some problems. I used to pay that bone and joint clinic. No telling how much money they got out of me. My kids were like Bubba. Uh, they'd break something every time you turn around. They were so active. And they just, just little things that uh, just happened. And you know, speaking of Georgia. What about Lee? Lee. It cut it off? No, what about Lee? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm leaving old Lee out. <laughs> Lee was, to me now, and I know I'm not going to finish. Lee just reminded me so much of me that I had a special place in my heart for him. He was the prettiest, prettiest little old boy you ever seen. So active. We got these pictures and stuff of him when, uh, when they were young. We got one of those videos of him playing football with Daddy out in the front yard of that house on Magnolia where you know, Daddy would be like a quarterback and throw lead him passes and he'd play in there. And he he was he'd just steal your heart. He he was just he was just such a cute, cute little old boy. And I used to tell my kids that they don't go back on that canal. You know, with the Baker Canal runs across the back of my place. Well back in those days, when the Connors lived there, we didn't have trash and garbage pickup. So like so many people, he just had a place back there that he would burn his trash. Well, through the years, they had thrown stuff in that canal. And I told Lee and them, I said, look, because there was always these kids over there. And I said, don't get in that canal. And so I'm looking out the back one day and I see two of them carrying Lee. And they come up to the house, well, he got in that canal. And undoubtedly, it was a broken milk jug. And he cut the leaders across the top of his toes. And you know, from what I've read, it says you, you cut those leaders and you told you, it, it affects you because you can't walk, you know, it balance and all this kind of stuff. Never forget, Dr. Martin took him up to Lane House, we rushed him up there, and Dr. Martin, I went into the operating room with him, and let me tell you something. Either those leaders in your foot go through those t toes, and he had cut them off. And when you cut those things, they draw back up into one side and draw back up into the other side. He took those little old tweezers and pulled those leaders out, and they're not color-coded now. They ain't color-coded. you got to know which one goes to which one. And he, I stood there and watched him. He took each one of those things and 
tied them back together and sewed them together. And it really never did affect Lee. You know, and, and I think about all my kids, and I, I, don't, I don't beat up on myself. Because, you know, you say, where did you go wrong, man? Where did you mess up? Because I learned one thing, and I, I mentioned this before. See, my kids had a terrible life. Now, they had a lot of perks that they got from being male's kid, but they got a lot of stuff that affected them uh, in a negative way. If my kids made the ball team, it wasn't because they were good, it was because they were the male's kid. Or if they made good grades in school, it wasn't because they were smart, it was because they were the male's. They had to live with that. And I think about it a lot, and I tried. Uh, Georgia was sick a lot uh, during our time together. Uh, she, would, uh, she wasn't deathly sick, but she just didn't feel good. She just wouldn't get up and take So I made a point to try to stay close to my kid as best I could. And I guess that's how I justify this in my mind because I know they little peers at school, everybody has an opinion of those males. Some love you, some hate you. And they would hear their little friend say, your daddy's an SOB, because he had heard his daddy say that Pete Heine was an SOB. Well, I said, you know, if, the, if my boys keep hearing that, if I don't stay close to them, and let them know who I really am, they're going to start believing that that kid is right. So I made it a point. I, I, man, I wouldn't feel like going, I'd be tired. But I would try to stay close to them. But you know, and this, this is for parents, that you need to know who your kids are running with. Because peers have such a, a prominent part of kids growing up. Where if, if, and I'm not blaming anybody, believe me, I'm not. My boy just made a wrong choice. George, uh, Kathy mentioned it at Lee's wake for sure. I remember saying that Lee just made the wrong choice uh, in what he was going to do in life. And I'm not blaming anybody, but I know peers have such an influence on your children, other peers. And, uh, so you got to watch them, you got to be careful. It's not going to be perfect. And, uh, but I'm comforted in one thing in my heart that I know, because the Bible says, if you will bring your children up in a right way, they may drift, they may go do all these kind of crazy things, but if God doesn't take them, one day they're going to come back. They're going to come back just like a dog does to his vomit. I don't know how much y'all know about dog, but if you've ever watched a dog throw up out there, he'll throw up and he'll come and go right back and to that vomit. And it's the same way with kids. But we had a good life and all of them never ever did leave anybody else. And I tell you, it's never over. <laughs> I, I got them great I got them great grandkids now. And the same problems I went with with my kids, I got them with my grandkids. I worry a lot more about their problems than they do. So anyway, that's just life, and that's part of it. But let me close off with this. You may have friends, but let me tell you something. When the chips are really down, the only one that is, you may fight like cats and dogs. I'm talking about siblings. You may fight like cats and dogs, but when the chips are down, that's who you got to depend on. They're going to be there. I guarantee they're going to be there. You may think they hate you, but they're going to be there when the time comes. I hope this told somebody something. <laughs> Thank you.